joining us to break down the biggest stories of 2021 are Latasha Brown, co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute. Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League. Michelle Singletary, personal finance columnist for the Washington Post and author of What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits. And Dr. Reed Tuxen, co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Welcome everyone. All right, we've got a lot to get to because 2021 was quite a year to say the least. Let's start off with kind of a rapid round. Michelle, I'll start with you. Very quickly, what was your top story of 2021? Well, I think for 2021, it was the uh, child tax credit, the advanced child tax credit. And, Great. and just that lifted millions of children out of poverty. Great. We'll be talking about that coming up. Mark, top story of 2021. The conviction of Derek Chauvin for murdering George Floyd. Thank you. We'll be getting to that, too. Latasha Brown. I think it's the conviction of the murderers of Ahmaud Aubrey. Mm, okay. Dr. Tuxen, your top story of 2021. The combination of COVID and the extraordinary, unprecedented disregard for human life and human survival by so many parts of our country, and unfortunately, by too many people, even in the Black community. Mm. Well, that is a place for us to start. Let's talk about COVID because obviously it still was a huge factor in all areas of our lives in 2021. So Dr. Tuxen, I'm going to start with you. You know, some experts say that like the flu, the coronavirus is really here to stay, whether that is with new variants like Omicron and Delta. So what does that mean for our community going forward? We still have a lot more to learn, but your premise of your question is absolutely correct. We will see this disease hanging around in one form or another for quite a while. It may well become what we call endemic, which is different than pandemic, endemic being like the flu. And we will be finding ourselves probably using all you know boosters and other vaccines uh, that will be modified depending on the number of mutations that occur. The reality is, straight to the point, is because we as a nation did not fight this effectively or hard enough uh, that this mutation of this disease will continue to uh, flourish and it will be with us uh, in one form or another uh, for a while. So we are going to, uh, in the coming year and two, learn to live with this disease, unfortunately, and we will not be able to eradicate it. That is very sad news because it was not inevitable and it didn't need to happen. What do you mean it was not inevitable? Explain that a little bit. We know that we had mechanisms to to try to really put this thing under control, whether it was mask wearing or now as we have the vaccines uh, that are available, booster shots and so forth. But because of the failure of political leadership, political will, because we as a nation, uh, too many uh, people in positions of power and unfortunately, as I mentioned, in the black community have Mm -hmm. elevated selfishness, uh, uh, self-concerned, self-absorption and economic priorities over human survival. We have not done what we needed to do enough. We did not wear our masks enough. We have not gotten enough people vaccinated. And we can clearly calculate the consequences in hundreds of thousands of unnecessary and preventable deaths. This is very clear cut. Latasha, you know, there was some good news on the COVID front in 2022. Obviously, Dr. Tuxen is 100% is correct, obviously, that there were needless deaths. At the same time, in the Black community, we were able to turn those vaccination rates around. Dr. Tuxum was part of those efforts. You live in a red state. And so I'm wondering how has COVID or has COVID changed life uh, in your state over the last year? You know, COVID has changed everything. You know, COVID has changed the way that we organize. COVID has changed the way that we engage with each other, the way that we do business, even the way that we show up to our workplace or work from home. And so vaccinations at least give us the opportunity to live. And so what we need is we need our communities to really understand that what is at stake. What we know is hundreds of thousands of people have died from COVID. Many that we know in our own families, many who have been our neighbors, people, and it was, and many, much of it was, 
preventable. And so we have to do whatever it takes for us to really be able to provide kind of protection for our communities and ourselves by wearing our masks, by getting vaccinated and really trying to marginalize the impact on our community because we already have health issues that make us very vulnerable with this disease, with this virus. I look at it on one hand, uh, I think it's remarkable that medical science was able to, in a year, uh, produce a vaccine which is, for the most part, effective. Uh, and I was proud that uh, uh, a Black woman by the name of Kismikia Corbett was central to that effort. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was predicted it could take three to five years yeah. to produce a vaccine, and thus we had a tool. But like the Dr. Tuxin, I was surprised and outraged uh, at the resistance, uh, the irrational resistance to uh, following uh, public health guidelines like mask wearing yeah. or recommendations uh, to be vaccinated. Now a, uh, a plethora of lawsuits are being filed all across the nation to block mask, man, uh, mask mandates. Uh, a political movement has spawned around uh, as though there's some great pride and some uh, connection to the notion of freedom associated with resisting yeah. uh, these mandates for a population that for the most part got vaccinated as infants yes. uh, with multiple vaccines uh, and a the backdrop of it being a 20th century where polio, smallpox, measles, mumps, and rubella were for the most part eradicated. The level of resistance, the type of resistance, the way this has become politicized has been just devastating. One of the things we've seen is our federal government trying, you know, mask mandates. We've seen local governments and businesses try, um, you know, vaccine mandates and mask mandates. You know, it makes you think, though, where is the point at which the federal government has done its part and we as citizens have to take the responsibility that if we're not going to use these tools, that's on us. Let's be real. You know, African-Americans have been, um, you know, skeptical of the government and the system for a very long time. You know, go back to this to see the uh, project. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the medical community has not done us well. You know, if, if for example, if I went into the doctors, they're not going to necessarily believe me more if it was another white woman the same age. So the, the reluctance, there's a history because of that reluctance. Now, having said that, you know, I think when they introduced that they were going to speed up and get this vaccine, well, the science was there already. And right. so they should, they didn't really accurately communicate that to our community. And so that's why this, I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I was like, I'm not taking this vaccine. I don't trust these white people. Um, <laughs> and then I talked to Dr. Grabowski at UMBC and he, and he and his wife um, were uh, part of the, the, the push to get this out to the community. And he persuaded me that says, you know, listen, the, the science is there. It's smart. You got to do this. And so I believed him rather than, you know, the Trump administration. Um, just hearing what speeds people made it, you know, people thought, well, this is just too quick. It's not, we're going to wait. And so when you talk to people who don't get it, what this is, is that they're not saying, I don't want to get it. I want to see what happens. What happens right. um, and that's where it's coming from. So when I write about this, I write about it from a financial point of view. So I said, listen, because money talks. So I said, if you get sick and you have <laughs> you know, you can't do your job or you die. That is a real cost to your family and your legacy. So we have to find a way to talk to people, to persuade them where they are. Yeah. Yelling at them, fussing at them, you know, telling them they're stupid. It's not, they're not going to come along that way. And we have to understand why there's resistance and then meet them there. And I think they will get vaccinated. Hang tight. We'll be right back. Be like we need major structural change. That the economic structure in this country is so that right. you have major companies like Amazon, where the owner is about to be on the path to be a trillionaire, right? And where people who are poor are still pushed on the margins. And so we're going to have to have a fundamental shift in the entire structure of this economy to go forward so there's a more equitable distribution of the resources that people that work should be able to take care of their families. Dr. Tuxen, last question on this section to you. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, you know, I've gone through my own health challenge this year. And what struck me is it's not a, we shouldn't be talking about this as there's a point when it's just over. It feels much more like there's twists and turns. We've got tools, we've got information to keep ourselves healthy, to keep our community safe, and to know that we may get other variants, we may get other challenges, but we can keep ourselves safe. We created something called the Black Coalition Against COVID. We brought together all of the medical schools, all of the NMA, the National Black Nurses Association, the Urban League, and BlackDoctor.org, leading digital health publisher, all in one arm. We've been partnering with the faith community, the Choose Healthy Life program, so our ministers. We have now, uh, uh, Karen, an infrastructure of the uniting between community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, and America's leading physician organizations, all who are prepared to your point, not only to fight COVID, but to also fight for the pre-existing conditions that were already killing us before. The right. only other point we have to make that is not the good news going forward is this mistrust that Mark talks about. And let's be very clear. We have an extraordinarily large number of African-Americans who are killing each other by poisoning the well with nonsense information and continually to spread and vomit information that is antithetical to our survival. And the, the tel cell phones, the, the internet, the, the social media platforms are finding, we're finding it very difficult to be able to overcome the pernicious impact of that misinformation. So there's good news for looking forward, but we're gonna have some real challenges in the coming year. So switching gears, Michelle, let's talk about the economy. COVID had ravaged our economy. Our, per, our individual economy, our national economy, our global economy. Now, towards the end of the year here, we're dealing with inflation. Give us a sense, looking into 2022, are we going to see these high levels of inflation or can we expect it to come down? Well, I will have to say that actually COVID has created um, uh, the haves and the have-nots, or I should say elevated, that there were many, many Americans who have done extremely well during COVID. Um, those who could work at home, who are more educated and have money in the stock market. The stock market, despite the sort of ups and downs that we saw towards the end of the year, has retur returned phenomenal returns. And so we've had people who are wealthier, in fact, so wealthy, that they've decided to retire, which is, is part of the great resignation. And then we have the rest of the, the economy, those who are in the service industry, most often um, African-Americans, who would have been devastated. They were already suffering, and COVID just pushed them over the edge. Um, and so that's what we're still facing and what we're going to face in 2022. The stimulus money is gone you know, uh, pretty much the uh, we've exhausted the uh, unemployment um, boost that happened. Uh, the, uh, December will end the advanced child tax credit pay monthly payments. And so going into 2022, there's going to be a swap of our population that is going to suffer because inflation is going up. And I don't think it's going to go down right away. Latasha, something else we saw um, is buy black, which was an expression of using our economic power in terms of um, supporting our community, but also I viewed it as an expression of social justice, quite frankly, and that helped to support some of these, these businesses. Do we think that's gonna continue into 2022 and beyond? I absolutely believe that we're going to continue to see. I think that there's a new trajectory around what Mark raised. I think that there are people who are being more resilient and looking more creatively and innovatively how they can survive um, and thrive with their families. But I also want to make sure that we acknowledge that 100% of the job loss were women, disproportionately women of color. And while entrepreneurship is certainly one road and one and 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 a, a space for many of us, there are millions of us that do not have the capital. Or or the resources to create a job or even the time um, of, of in terms of entrepreneurship, but still have been wage workers. And they, this has been a devastating period for them. When we're yeah. looking at the rise of evictions, when we're looking at people who have been burdened, not having access to childcare, when we're looking at people who are on these jobs that there's no security, they're not given a living wage. We have seen extraordinary um, struggle, particularly from the poorest of our population. The, 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 marginal, the most marginalized have yeah. actually gone further 
further in debt and are more vulnerable. And so that's why we have to really recognize even how COVID it is an economic out um, cry for even COVID that those families, when you have a family member who is a, a contributor to the family that has now been sick or have, has died, that has a tremendous economic impact on our communities. And so I think that yes, while there, there is a bright light of us looking at how creatively we can create um, entrepreneurship opportunities. I think we also have to make sure that we're thinking about the administration on how we want to have a living wage so that all people, all people who are going to work, they're able to provide for them and their families and they have the kind of support they need. This is so good. Stay where you are because we'll be right back. Welcome back to our viewers. We've still got a lot to cover. We know women disproportionately, as we, as you mentioned, childcare makes it harder for us to get back in the workforce. We are caregivers. We are childcare. We have a senior of our parents and seniors as well as our children. And so I guess my question here is, what will it take, Michelle, I'll start with you, to get women to undo this trend with women and get women back into the workforce, get these numbers back up? Well, it's going to take a number of things. We have to make sure that there is affordable health care. And on the part of that is also the people who are taking care of the children, that they have a living wage. You know, one of the reasons why people can't afford it is because the workers can't, you know, they can't find people to do that job because it pays so little. And then we have to make sure that we have health care. I love the fact that there's more entrepreneurs, but oftentimes they go without health insurance so that if anything happens, they go under fairly quickly. Um, you know that most bankruptcies are because of medical debt. Um, and so where's healthcare? It's tied to your job. If you're you know, working for yourself, you often aren't carrying it unless they're in the ACA um, uh, marketplace. Um, and so, you know, all we've got to put together a package that takes care of healthcare, um, childcare, um, and then education. You know, it's very expensive to go to college. And then if they do, they got to take out these huge loans. Um, and so we've got to have an affordable way for people to go to school, either community colleges or certificate programs or certification programs where they can boost their skills. Because we do know that in this economy, those who did well more likely had a college education. Um, and if you could work at home, even the better. And so it's going to take a package of things. But you see where Congress is. We can't get there because we still in this country believe that people should have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, which is an idiotic expression, because if you try to do that you're going to fall over. And so that's why we need help. The challenge, and let's be really, really, really clear eyed about it. Healthcare costs are going to continue to go up. Uh, everything that has happened with COVID with more people now who are sick, particularly in the black community, are going to be bringing more disease into the system, which costs more to take care of. Unfortunately, also, is almost every new intervention, especially on drugs and in areas of like cancer, those drugs will cost a lot more than they have ever cost before. And so there's going to need, as Latasha says, a shaking out of how we will be able to decide what is insured and what isn't. What can you get? What should you be able to get? And what can't you? The bottom line, Karen, that we going into this new year as a Black community have to remember, we have got to take care of ourselves, that we have got to do the things that we know we're supposed to do to prevent disease, catch it early, and manage it. But if we think that we can buy our way out with medical insurance to be able to go to a doctors and hospitals, we're going to be in very bad shape. We have got to take control over our own lives, and we've got to do it today. Can I just add something on that? Because I, I, I think, I, all right, y'all know how I am, so I'm just going to be good. <laughs> this is a very academic, we're all very educated. I got two degrees. We got a doctor on here. But we also have to remember that a lot of reasons why people have bad habits have to do with mental health and where we came from and all the stress. It's We can't just, we, I mean, I, I, I got two degrees. My husband's got two degrees. It's easy for me to say, you just need to eat better. You just a new day. You, but but if you're a working mom and you, you live in a community that doesn't have good grocery stores or it costs a lot to go someplace or you can't take off 
to go to the doctors. I mean, we got to recognize that there's a lot of barriers for people to do, to take care of their individual issues to help while we're trying to work on the policy side. So we still need to meet people where they are. That mom or that dad that's working all day long it, and it, they can't afford to take off a whole day to go to the doctor. So we that's why we do have to work with companies to give people sick leave and t- and personal time off because part of the reason people are so stressed because they're taking care of everybody in their family. I mean, sure. I made it out, but, you know, other people have it. So what I'm saying is that we can't just do like this to people all the time. Well, Michelle, I don't want to be in the place of finger wagging, but let us be also, and, and it's the tyranny of the and. But I want to be very clear because I all of my work has been in South Central L.A., the, the heart of core of D.C., uh, and in New York and Philadelphia. So I'm where you are. But I and I think your point is well made. However, and in addition, we know that we are making d- bad decisions when we yeah. have the ability to make those decisions. And we cannot always be perpetual victims. We have to control that which we can control. Let's do the tyranny of the and and not the or. Thanks, everyone. If we're talking about making good decisions, one of the biggest, best decisions that black and brown folks did in 2020 was we came out and we voted in record numbers. And we have seen in 2021, in response to that, a backlash, a whiplash, if you will, of measures being passed throughout this country at the state level, And we've been trying to get legislation passed at the federal level. We're seeing partisan gerrymandering, redistricting, all sorts of anti-voter measures. So, Latasha, I'm going to come to you on this one. When I think about 2021 and the struggles of 2021 going into 2022, it looks as though we're still going to be fighting for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, which is going to be critical. Folks are looking ahead to a midterm election. How critical are those two pieces of legislation for our community and our ability to vote and to be able to have a say in our democracy and in making these good decisions? Let me say this. I'm deeply disappointed that we are at the end of 2021 and Black voters are actually being punished um, in my state of Georgia and all around this country for the way that we voted and how we voted. The pro- the challenge is, what I have to acknowledge is we've been here before, that this is a part of the same Jim Crow playbook. There are three things that have always been barriers around when we're talking about our power and political participating, participation. There's always been an issue around access, that there are those who try to restrict and find ways to restrict access. We see that with the passage of SB202 with 40 uh, bills that were introduced in 48 states and passed in 33 states to actually restrict voting, whether that's shortening absentee ballot voting, whether that was changing rules on who votes at the polls or whether that's creating an ID requirement. The second thing is about creating a culture of fear. We have to recognize that there is an effort to create a culture of fear so that people won't feel like comfortable that they can show up to the polls. That part of when we see some of these political arrests where a woman that went to vote in Texas is now facing five years in prison because she voted and she thought that she had the ability to be that she could vote that we're seeing that there's all of these elements of culture fin and the third piece that's always been weaponized in the administrative process and so you see in places like um georgia you see in places like um, texas where when we're talking about redistricting process that in georgia a hundred percent of the population growth in the last 10 years were communities of color how is it that the republicans have actually drawn maps where give them an advantage the same thing in Texas, that the growth has come from communities of color, but what you're actually seeing is you're seeing more representation go to to the Republican um, voters, Republican-leaning voters. The bottom line is we're still in this playbook process of democracy being unraveled or democracy only being available to, the two, uh, to a few. How are we going to continue this fight in 2022, both for voting rights, but to protect our democracy and voting obviously being the most fundamental of our democracy. I'm more than disappointed, and I do not want to pull from my vocabulary the words as to how I truly feel at the failure of the United States Senate to pass the John Lewis bill 
and the Freedom to Vote bill. Mm -hmm. The heart of the matter is, is that those two bills would create an opportunity for us to thwart a great deal of the voter suppression we are seeing, create a tool for us to battle the gerrymandering, both racial and partisan that we are seeing. And the question will be, are there 50 Democratic senators with conviction and fortitude who are willing to do what is necessary? And what is necessary is to create for the 162nd time mm -hmm. a exception to the filibuster rule to pass these two bills. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. One of the other big stories Mark mentioned, the Jaren Ben Latasha, the Derek Chauvin trial, the Greg and Travis McMichael trials. And I'm referring to the criminals because I think that's important. When William Roddy Bryan, I also think, Dr. Tuxon, I'm coming to you on this one. The result of the Charlottesville trial was, was very important. What do those, if we take those three together, knowing that there were disappointments along the way too. But if we take these three, what does that tell us about the cause of justice and racial equity in 2021 in America? It tells us that our lives are imperiled. Our lives are imperiled at every level of our existence, from the conversation you just had to the ability for people in power to just murder us and without, uh, too often without accountability. And that is extraordinary. What I think is particularly important, though, from my perspective, is that I work, work from, an out, from, a, from a perspective of an undying love for Black people. That's where I begin. That's where I'm at. Now, when I look at Black Lives Matter, and I see the momentum that we have as we take to the streets to say that my dignity, my sense of who I am must be respected in this society. I see that clarion call as important as we embrace and, 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 and confront those outside of our community. But what I would also want to see is that we would embrace that inside of our community. If Black lives matter, they have to first matter to us. And that means that we, we, whether it's the COVID fight or whether it is the fight for pre-existing health conditions, we have got to make a decision that says that we will come together as a community of people and we will support each other to be able to maximize our health, our lives, and our God-given human potential. Latasha, do the results of those, the outcomes, I should say, of these trials Give us hope. What gives me hope in the outcome of those trials is not because in any way I have hope into that justice system. The truth of the matter is it took four DAs in the Ahmaud Arbery case to right. even get that the DA actually refused to even try that. But you know how it happened? It happened because there was a determined Black woman who was a mother and had a community of support around her. When we look at the George Floyd uprisings, I believe that we got that outcome because there was an outcry in the streets that were led by community people saying and putting the pressure. And so some of the outcomes that we saw happen in these, these results, I don't think they're a result of us saying, see at, at how the justice system works. I think right. it's the contrary. I, I think the fact that we're getting to this point, the fact that we're actually having to bite our nails, whether we can get a gu guilty conviction from men who actually hunted and ran somebody down that was jogging in their own community is indicative of the challenges and why this, um, this criminal justice system has to be completely uprooted and restructured. But what I do think what gives me hope is the resilience of our people and that whenever we work together collectively and organize ourselves in our power, we can actually get results and continue to push those results. I want to just switch gears a little bit here, talk about some of the other things that were happening at the federal level and how they will benefit our community. You mentioned in our opening the child tax credit. And so I wonder if you could talk about the impact that you see that having along with other things, because I think it's important when we talk about policy, that it has to be things fitting together in certain ways. Can you talk about some of those bright spots and what people should be looking for? 
Yeah, you know, in the midst of something that was so devastating as COVID, out came an anti-poverty measure that has made all the difference in family lives. You know, the tax credit wasn't new, but what happened was they decided, let's give it to people on a monthly basis, because guess what? People actually can manage their money on a monthly basis. And so they gave it to them on a monthly in advance, and they also increased the amount that families were getting. Um, And that has kept so many people from slipping below and it actually boosted, I think the figure was about 40% of kids out of poverty because they had food to eat and parents could pay for rent. Um, the last of those payments are the, in December, the advance payments. Now people can apply for the rest of those payments um, when they file their taxes, but under Biden's, you know, uh, build be- a better, um, uh, build better <laughs> program, right? They want to now, you know, institutionalize that. So make it so that people get those payments every month. And I think that's a great idea. Hang tight. We'll be right back. We're good when there's a crisis. People kind of pull together. But when that crisis ends, tells you whether or not you're going to have a society that is going to help the least of them. I mean, that's why we put Social Security in place. There was a crisis, right? And then they said, well, you know what? Let's make sure that we give people a baseline of income. That's how Social Security was created. This is where we are now. We're at that period now where we were of the Great Depression, where we're saying, Let's not just give people a little bit. Let's give them a way to to gain some ground. Did the Biden Harris administration do enough to help our economy? I believe that they did. I mean, the stimulus package, there were three that were passed, um, and they had to fight for that. I made a huge difference fighting for the advanced child tax credit and now trying to continue some of those measures. We know that the unemployment benefit system is broken. You know, it's, you know, done by state by state. And we know that many people, it took them weeks, if not months, to get their unemployment, those boosted unemployment papers, uh, uh, payments, because the unemployment systems in various states were just overwhelmed. They inundated. They couldn't hit handle the request. Um, And so, yeah, I think that they ushered in some new programs. Mark Morial, what grade would you give the Biden-Harris administration as they close out their first year in office? I give them a B plus. uh, And and I think on the economic front, the president boldly uh, initially proposed a $6 trillion package. Uh, The infrastructure package was pared back to $1.2 trillion. Uh, And now the uh, the second component, the human infrastructure package, is now uh, in the 175 range. Uh, let's be just brutally frank. This is about a broad consensus among the American people for strong public investments in things that have been overlooked for years, like children and workforce and seniors and infrastructure, and a Democratic caucus that has two outliers in the Senate. That's the bottom line here. Natasha. Let me say what I think of the administration. I'll be honest with you. I'm struggling not to give them a C minus. I'm going to say a C at best. And let me say why. I think he actually gets an A. Uh, The Biden administration gets an A around what they've done at COVID. I think he did an extraordinary job of getting um, um, uh, issues out around COVID, making sure that people had access to the vaccine. I think he's done an excellent job around the child tax credit. He has gotten a straight up F on voter suppression issues around dealing with voter, the fact that we don't have voting rights legislation legislation right now. I don't think it's either pass or fail. He's failed on that so far. Mm -hmm. I think in addition to that, when you look at, when I think of the images of Afghanistan and when I look at the images of Haitians, I've not forgotten those images of seeing black people who were Mm -hmm. literally chased down like they were dogs on, on the back of horses, that that was under his administration. And so when I look at, when we're talking about immigration, how black immigrants are actually being deported at higher rates than everybody else, other immigrants in this country, that is a full failure. When I look at the economic structure in this country that what we saw in the last year, that yes, while there were people who did very, very well, but that you still had a 100% of the job losses were women and women of color, that is an economic failure. So the community in which I represent, that I think that he has not done enough. We still don't have criminal justice reform. We still don't have voting rights legislation. We still don't have anything that comprehensive other than yes, and we know how normally when the infrastructure, in the infrastructure bill, as it works, it's going to be interesting to see how Black 
companies fare out at the yes. end, end, end of that. And so in, for, for that reason, I give a C. As it comes to Kamala, let me say I openly must say that I am a supporter of Kamala. I actually think that in many ways, the media has actually held her at a particular standard. They've not ha- held, held a single white boy that has been in that position. That at the end of the day, that she is the vice president, not the president. She has met, she has actually taken on two of the hardest issues um, in this administration, but ultimately it is the president who has the power to actually be able to move that. And so I actually believe and continue to support that sister because as a black woman, I know how oftentimes we're used as a scapegoat where okay. others will put us in a position so that it seems like we're the problem or that the failure, we get the brunt of it when we're doing everything that we can behind the scenes to actually move things. And I've seen her, I've talked to her, I know she cares passionately about yeah. voting rights and she cares passionately about our community. And because of that, I'm still and will continue to be a supporter of, of hers. Dr. Duxon, yep. uh, your grade for the Biden-Harris administration and anything you want to weigh in on with regard to Vice President Harris and her performance this year. I will give them a B. And the elements that I am celebrating about them is that they have been working hard with people like Mark Morial and myself to find the dollars and push the uh, government agencies to fund community-based and faith-based infrastructures that are necessary for healthy communities. And that has been very important to try to turn around the spigot of who gets the money. And and, and this is something that we've been fighting for our community-based and faith-based organizations. As far as Kamala Harris is concerned, uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, that she is working hard behind the scenes uh, to make sure that these government agencies are being accountable. And I will say in summary that when we needed to say to uh, some of these agencies that could not see their way uh, to do right by Black communities in our fight for health and fight for COVID, we were able to use the impromptu of Kamala Harris and say that she's got her head in the game. A lot of people don't realize she's got her head in the game and that she has so much influence, but we can see it. It's not in the newspaper, but it's behind the scenes. And I do want to give her credit for it. Thank you, Dr. Tuxin. Well, you all, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to try. I'll start with you, Mark. What gives you hope for 2022? Well, I hope is eternal. I'm an eternal optimist. I trust our people to continue the fight. Uh, And that's what gives me hope. I think we are a resilient, strong, resourceful community. uh, And we are going to keep on keeping on. And that gives me hope. And I think the economic standing of the country, uh, if we can get past COVID a little more, uh, I think that with the investments that this administration uh, plans to make, uh, I think we have an opportunity to put a debt in the wealth gap put a debt in the income gap, and raise the standing of those who've been historically locked out and left out. Michelle, what gives you hope for 2022? Um, I, 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 I like what Latasha said about um, the fact that we have always been fighters. And I just sort of think, you know, I'm a direct descendant of enslaved folks. And I remember um, my grandmother telling me stories about how they had to, what they had to do to live. And so I'm very encouraged that we are going to fight this. And and I I totally agree with Mark. We have got to get those voting rights um, bills passed because that has an economic impact. When you vote the right people in, they vote your economic interest. And so I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful because I work in the community, as all of us on this call do. And I see the hard work that people are doing. I see people trying to change. And that that really, you know, that helps me. I'm, I'm a faith-based kind of woman, and I see the things <laughs> that my own church is doing. And so I, I got to have faith, because what else? You can't have anything but faith, right? right. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to 2022 and us turning around a lot of these issues. Latasha, what gives you hope for 2022? It is the resistance and the resilience of our people that ultimately we have been here before and we always rise to the occasion and we are going to create the kind of democracy that we deserve and that we desire. I believe in us and that is what gives me hope. You get the last word. 
Uh, what gives me hope is first an undying love for black people, how we come together, always have loved each other and been there for each other. And the second thing that gives me hope is what we've seen this year is an unprecedented coming together of our medical leadership and talent, along with our community based and our faith based uh, leaders all bonding together for the sustained fight ahead. We've got an infrastructure now and a commitment. We're energized and I see good things ahead for the black community when it comes to our health. Thank you all so much. And thanks so much to our audience for watching. You all have been fantastic. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. As we close out 2021, I want to say a huge thank you to TV One and our whole crew. And we're looking forward to 2022.